Okay, well, it is time for us to uh, start services. We're gathered together here today on this Sabbath, on the ninth day of the tenth month, and based on our reckoning, we are in the 41st year of the 40th Jubilee. Welcome everyone to our Sabbath services. I'd like to start services by asking James if he would please open in prayer. If you'll all stand. James? Yes, thank you. Our Father, Yehovah, we're here assembled before you on this uh, day of our gathering together in assembly throughout planet Earth, your creation, what you made. We give you appreciation for these uh, days of rest that should be given to the all of your creation. You're part of a group that keeps all of your law, including the land Sabbath, so that all of your creation has its opportunity to recover from its use that's being put to or overuse really by the neglect of these land Sabbaths. And really we're all suffering from not keeping your law and your way of life. So we make our very best efforts to explain to those that we meet or can communicate with that we can be sure to express with the correct words that all men must keep your way and not invent ways of our own that are in conflict with your very plain words. So we're here today having responded to the summons to receive your battle plans in this greatest battle ever in these end days of this 6,000 year period has been seemingly given over to the mind of man before we go into this millennial period we'd ask please for the protection of Donald Trump his wife and family all those that are helping him make completely public the corruption that the United States of America has been subjected to and all the world and stop this horrendous pedophilia and pedivores and abortions that are being used as sacrifices to bail and these spirit entities that appear to have been released in these very end days as you very clearly warned us about so we can be strengthened by listening to and studying your words sabbath to sabbath new moon to new moon and during the three feast days that we've been given these periods of rest to take our minds off ourselves and direct our minds to you and getting to know you better and more completely following your way of life without fear for we are not afraid of this mind that's trying to control us please help us not to be deceived and very clearly laid out your plan for you your people and your creation and it's very simple to follow and help us strengthen strengthen our minds that we can take our thoughts captive and have them pointed and directed to you so that we're not subject to the deception that's come upon all mankind and please strengthen us so that we can stand up under any assaults regardless of who from, and we can be good and faithful witnesses to your way, be proper ambassadors of your way, so we 
have the authority to express your will to all we come in contact with. So we give you greatest appreciation through everything that you've given to us, especially the comprehension of your and your will in our lives. So we give you thanks for everything and all the glory, of course, is yours. And we give you thanks by the authority of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen to that. <clears throat> if you'll uh, remain standing and take up your hymnals, we'll uh, open our song service with a hymn that comes from Psalm 99, which can be found on page 75 of the hymnal, titled Holy Mighty Majesty. That's Holy Mighty Majesty on page 75 to kick off our song service this glorious Sabbath day. Okay, well, you all sound great from here. So, if you'll now turn to page 84. On page 84, we'll sing our second hymn, which comes from Psalm 107, titled, Oh, That Men Would Praise Their God, after which we'll turn the mic over to Wes to bring us the weekly news update. But first, page 84, Oh, That Men Would Praise Their God.
So if you will please stand, we'll have our third hymn, which comes uh, from Psalm 119. It can be found on page 91, after which uh, we'll turn the mic back over to West to read in the book of Genesis, chapters 25 through 27. But first, we'll sing page 91, For Thy Law is Truth and Love. And the law of God definitely is truth and love. God is love, and the law stems from His character. And uh, He provided that law to us because He loves us and wants us to be prosperous and happy. And He knows um, being our Creator and the Creator of all, he knows what's best for us. So uh, we look to him for that guidance. So page 91, for thy law is truth and love, after which Wes will read in the book of Genesis, chapters 25 through 27. Okay, if you will be seated, we'll turn the mic back over to Wes to read in the book of Genesis, chapters 25 through 27. Wes, back over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Chapter 25. Sad one here. The death of Abraham. Abraham took another wife. What was he? when he took another wife. He was 130, well, I don't know when he, how, he was 130, his wife, his, his wife was 127 or 23, and he was 10 years older. So he was about at least 130 when he, when he started looking anyway. I don't know how, it doesn't say how soon he married, but she bore him, it was five sons. By the way, that equals seven. Joken Shane was the father of Sheba. How about that? Dedan, the descendant of, of Dedan, were the Asherites, the Lech, Stan, Let Us Shemites, and the Leonumites, the son of Mabin, were Ephra and Eper, Hen Hen Henoch, Adid and 
El-Adad. All these were descendants of Ketra. Well, can you imagine standing at the door to call your sons in? Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. Hmm. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to his sons of his concubine and sent them away from his sons, Isaac, to the land of the east. Altogether, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last breath and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people, his son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Maimir in the field of Ephron, son of Zoar, the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son, Isaac, who then lived near Beerland, Rio, Ishmael's son. This is the second, this is the account of Abraham, second, of the Is. well, I'm tongue-tied today, I'm sorry. This is the account of Abraham's son, Ishmael, whom Sarah made servant Hagar, the Egyptian, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the son of Ishmael. Oh, man, give me a break. Listed in the order of their birth. Nebai Otha, the firstborn of Ishmael. Kedar, Adbil, My Basham, Mish, Mishma, Doma, Massa, Hadad, Tima, Jehur, Napish, and Kedima. These were Ishmael's. I got to turn the page. Sons, and these were the names of their twelve tribal rulers, according to their settlements and their camps. Altogether, Ishmael lived 137 years. Now, I forgot that. He breathed his last breath and died. And he was gathered to his people. His descendants settled in the area from Havla to Shur, near the borders of Egypt. As you go toward Asher, and he lived, in hostility toward all their brothers. Jacob and Esau. This is the account of Abraham, son of Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, a Bethul, the Armenian from Pada. Aram, and sister of Laban, the Armin. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayers, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. You remember what it says? Watch what you pray for. <laughs> the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two people from within you will be separated and the older will serve the younger. Verse 24, when the time came for her to give birth, there were tw twin boys in her womb. 
The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, and with his hand gripping Esau's heel. You know, usually the head comes out first. But Jacob's hand come out before his head. How about that? So he was named Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old. How about that? You get that? He was married when he was 40, and he was 60 when he had two sons. When Rebecca gave birth to them, the boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying alone among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have something of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why it was all called Edom. Now, what, what Monty says, Abraham had just died when this happened. And they always cooked this stew. To this day, there's a stew that they cook when the when deceased die. And uh, Esau was out fooling around and starts playing, paying reverence to his grandfather. Let me get back to the story. I'm just telling you what Monty said. And the Jews, you know, they, they prolonged their traditions right from the day one. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What is his birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Chapter 26, Esau and Abimelech. I'm, I'm sorry, not Esau, Isaac and Abimelech. Now there was a famine in the land besides the earlier famine of the Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, at Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I will tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you, and you will be blessed. For you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make you descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them all these lands, and there <clears throat> your offsprings, all nations of the earth, will be blessed, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements and my commandments and my decrees and my laws. So Isaac stayed and get your heart. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she's my sister, because he was afraid to say, she's my wife. He thought, the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca, because she is beautiful. Now, mind you, she's 60, isn't she? <clears throat> when Isaac had been there a long time, Rebecca I'm sorry, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from the window and saw Isaac car car caressing his wife, Rebekah. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac answered, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, 
What is this that you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave order to all the people, anyone who molests this man's or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that, that land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servant had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filled them with earth. They smite their own face too, but you know what I mean? Disgusting. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there, there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abimelech died, Abraham died. And he gave them the same name that his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Giar quarreled with him, herdsmen, and said, the water is ours. So he named the well Iske because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitatna. He moved from, on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth saying, now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and you will increase in the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Uzzah, his personal advisor, and Philco, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said, there ought to be a, a, a sworn agreement between us between us and you, let us make a treaty with you that you will do no, us no harm, just as we did not molest you, but also treated you well and sent you away in peace. And now you are blessed by the Lord. Isaac then made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac said to them on their way, and they left him in peace. That day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug. And they said, we found water. He called, in, he called it Sheba, and to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Bira, the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of 
Elon the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob gets Isaac's blessing, chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not no longer see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your weapon your quill and your bow, and go out to the open country to hunt and s some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of, of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening to, to as Isaac spoke to, to his son Esau. When Esau left for, for the open country to hunt game and drink, bring it back, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare it for, for some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say and go get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with goat skin. Then she handed to her some of Jacob, some then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, my father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Now Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord, your God, gave me su success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near to me so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize them, for his hands were hairy like his, those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. You are really my son, Esau, he, he asked. I replied, I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate it and he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell 
of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of an open field. The Lord that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew and earth's riches, an abundance of grain and new wine. Many nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brother and may the son of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had secretly left his father present, his brother Esau came in from the hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it into his father. Then his father said to him, my father, sit up and eat some of this game, my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came. And I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, bless me too, my father. But he, he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you received any blessings for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you, and have made all his relatives, his servants. I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me to your father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him. You will dwell, your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of the heaven above. You will live by the sword. You will serve your brother, but when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from your neck. Jacob flees to Laban. Esau heard, held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the day of mourning for my fathers are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau Saul is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban and and." And Haran, stay with him for a while until your brother fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word to you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I disguised with living, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. Wow. Sorry, I messed up a couple of times. I get excited. Back at you, Dave. 
Thanks, Wes. Appreciate that. Good reading. You know, those, uh, those names are quite the challenge, as you well know. If you'll all stand, you know, it's, it's interesting to note that, uh, that uh, you know, God had already told Isaac that Jacob would rule over Esau. And then, you know, Esau sells his birthright and his mother and his brother conspired to steal his blessing. He despised his birthright and gave it away for a bowl of soup. And then he says that, you know, Jacob cheated him out of his birthright. But then, so he despised his birthright, but then Jacob and his mother conspired to steal the blessing as well. So it's... Uh, you know, it's interesting how how God works, you know, and rather than waiting on God and his plan, they decide to take matters into their own hands. And, um, you know, it, we've been discussing lately the, the concept of predestination, and it's interesting, you know, that... Uh, that uh, things worked out just as God said. And, you know, did God intervene and, and cause Jacob and, and Rebekah to do that? And Isaac or uh, Esau to, to uh, despise his birthright? Or did he just know they were going to do it? And so he, he told Jacob what he told him. Uh, you know, it's, I, don't, I, don't know I don't have the answer, but uh, it's interesting to consider. Okay. So, page 103, if you'll please stand, we'll sing our fourth hymn, which comes from Psalm 137, titled, By the Waters of Babylon, after which we'll have our main message, which is a continuation of our coverage of the reading of the law of God. Um, and we're going to cover the reading of the second commandment today, uh, which comes from, uh, is presented by James Daly. And um, by all means, you know, as we're studying through these, if you have input or commentary, uh, you can feel free to send a, a note to James and me. Um, you can feel free to bring it up in open discussion, whatever um, makes you most comfortable. But the goal here is to, you know, vet these, these law papers in preparation for the reading of the law next year. So... Uh, Feel free to send us your comments and suggestions. But first, we'll sing page 103, By the Waters of Babylon.
Okay, if you'll all be seated, we'll now have our main message, Reading the Second Commandment by James Daly. Reading the Second Commandment, 2012, Leviticus 19, verse 4. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. Exodus 20, 4-6 says, You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in the heaven above or the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, Yehovah, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and, third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's from the King James. In Deuteronomy 5, 8 to 10, you shall not make for yourselves a carved image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yehovah, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's from the uh, English Standard Version, uh, which is used throughout except for noted. So here's a Western definition of idol. Uh, is a noun. It's an image or other material object representing a deity to which religious worship is addressed. The Bible, in the Bible, they're saying a, a an image of a deity other than God, or b the deity itself. Three, any person or thing regarded with blind admiration, adoration, or devotion. The expression here is, i.e., uh, Madame Curie had been her childhood idol. And uh, Article 4, a mere image or a semblance of something visible but without substance as a phantom. 5 is a figment of the mind or a fantasy. The origins are from the 1200 to 1250 in Middle English, Late Latin, idolium, the Greek, idolon, meaning image, idol, the derivative of idios uh, with a shape or form. So you're, you're talking about shapes and form being given, representational of uh, your fantasy, so it is representing your mind and what you're thinking. So uh, we have uh, representational imagery uh, or trees, stones, hills, rivers, which people believe they have access to the spirit entity being solicited by either going to these places or going to these trees or using a crossroads where rivers cross road or rivers hit the seas or all places of power in this uh, pagan theology that's all come from uh, the Babylonian military religions. And that is uh, throughout the whole world, really. And uh, it's uh, remarkable if you're in a society that, that is uh, submerged in it, you know, like India and other places, it, it would appear a, a astonishing on the surface. And yet we can often catch ourselves doing similar types of things, just in a, in a slightly different way. Now, we have uh, individual people or groups like nations as legal fictions being given the status in our minds above the Creator, who has a preeminent claim on all. All of us, all of them, all of His creation, and all of planet Earth. It's His private property, and so are we. And our obligation is to obey Him. His laws are in place to provide liberty and health and wealth to us if we would only do it. But uh, there has been a, a deception put on all of us this last few hundred years at the same time we're receiving these physical blessings and the curses aren't put upon us even in our idolatry. The, the end time events have been getting played for. Now, the, the greatest curse on all people is idolatry. We have been warned and believe this which is why we are all in attendance at God's feasts, specifically the Feast of Tabernacles in the every seventh year, reading His law so we can all gain a better understanding of our obligations to, to uh, honor our Father and 
give him the glory. We'll start off with an unusual place here. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 to 14. Now these things happened to them as an example, but were written down for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages has come. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed unless he falls. So we in these end days are the most privileged, the best protected of the brethren and the 144,000 and the great multitude of Gentiles of the last 40 jubilees or 2,000 years. What privilege we have that we have all these scriptures that were written down as an example. Example to who? They're written down as an example for us in the end times, in these ages. So it's just so we should be cautious about our tendency to complain about things because we have this wonderful opportunity to understand the plan of God, his plan of reconciliation for his creation and even the fallen host, and perhaps we can even play a part in it. So, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to men. That's mankind, includes women. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with this temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, free from idolatry. Now, imagine no temptation will overtake us that is not common to all people. But because uh, God Almighty is faithful, he will not let us, any of us, be tempted beyond our ability to stand up with the temptation. So you can't be oppressed above what your ability to withstand it can be. What a remarkable promise and how well we're protected. So even though we are persecuted and do have difficult situations happen, what a remarkable promise that we have. And on top of that, he will open a door. He will provide the way of escape so you may be able to endure it. So whatever circumstances you may be finding yourself in, understand you will not be given more than you can endure and you will be given a way of escape. So uh, just hold fast and, and serve your Creator and uh, see what happens. To do this, we must have absolute, or at least better, control of our thinking. Because it's usually our thinking process to get us all into trouble and maybe even cause the idolatry in our lives that we allow to perhaps take over our life. So you see, Second Corinthians 10, 3-5, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We don't load up with weapons and, and form militias and go out and, and fight back and kill people. Ours are, are, are weapons are scripture. That's what we have to use. Yet, we are certainly free to defend yourself in your house, protect your family. Somebody comes into your house at night and you uh, protect your family and they be, are killed in the dark. That's not murder. That's not manslaughter. It's defending your home and yourself and your family. So, yes, you can resist evil and you can use physical force to do that. Talking about the physical war that mankind loves to participate in, we can't do it. We have to use your tongue and you have to use your mind and mostly you have to use scripture for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh and we have divine power to destroy strongholds how? We destroy arguments, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And there's enough of that to keep us all busy for the next millennium. Um, against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So now, you, the all baptized individuals, are responsible to control your thoughts. Now, in the Babylonian military religion and paganism, how they do it, they train their children from very young to to um, be able to control their imagination, to try to govern themselves as they sit quietly, um, usually uh, in, a, in a physical position that, that affects their nervous system, and concentrate on only one idea. And as they get older, you get the ability of, over time to just really put out all types of thinking except this one idea. And then the idea is that you, when you put out the last idea you hold in your mind, you can have com communication with the spirit world, meaning you're possessed by demons. So this is not something to be doing here. What this is talking about of taking every thought captive is 
ensure your thinking is in line with the outline of the plan of God as you're thinking, and don't get sidetracked on, on the improper thinking so you're controlling your thoughts. You're not losing your ability to think. You should be developing it. This is what this is talking about, so that you can destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of Yehovah Sabaoth, take every thought captive so you start thinking like Jesus Christ did. Now, you know what he was doing. He was up on the temple steps railing at the Pharisees, calling them both thinking liars and hypocrites. That would be like a converted Catholic going up on the steps of the Vatican and telling them that God isn't the Catholic guys and railing on the Jesuits. Same type of thing. Death sentence. But, now, we're not recommending we all start doing that type of thing, but you most certainly can in your strength and your thoughts to obey and think like Jesus Christ did, spiritually applying the letter of the law. So, aside from manufacturing idols to gain supposed access to the Almighty, our unbecoming conduct and thinking is idolatry as well. Colossians 5, 5 to 6, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to the immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of things that the wrath of God will come. So it's putting yourself above your Creator, making you self God in your in your own standing, similar to what Satan was trying to do, and this amounts to idolatry. So be careful. Control your thoughts and you will control what you do. So the penalty for individuals and whole nations and tribes for idolatry, either made with your hands or manufactured in your minds, is war, famine, and captivity. So Deuteronomy 29, 14 to 25. It is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before Jehovah our God, and with whomever is not here with us today. You know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. You have seen their detestable things, their idols of wood, stone, silver, gold, which were among them. Beware lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from Jehovah, our Elohim, to go and serve the gods of these nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. The one who, when he hears himself in his heart saying, I'll be safe, even though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart, this will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. Jehovah will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of Jehovah and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him, and Jehovah will blot out his name from under heaven. And Jehovah will single him out from all of the tribes of Israel for calamity in accordance with all of the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. Now the next generation, your children, who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from far away, from a far land, will say, when they see the afflictions of that land and the sickness with which Jehovah has made it sick, the whole land will be burnt out with brimstone and salt and nothing sown and nothing growing where no plant can sprout and overthrow like the, that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which Jehovah overthrew in his anger and wrath. All the nations will say, Why has Jehovah done this to this land? What caused the heat of this great anger? Then people will say, It is because they abandoned the covenant of Jehovah, the Elohim of their forefathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Every one of us has been born into the covenant. All of our forebearers from Northwest Europe, the lost, supposed lost tribe, ten tribes of Israel, they all made the covenant with their father, and you are in it by inheritance. At your conversion, when you realize that you hadn't been doing it correctly or acting against your father, you stopped sinning and converted to the renewed covenant. By renewed, it's not just the New Testament, it's a renewed. It's the Old Testament with the spiritual application of the law applied. So, Galatians 5, 16 to 21, But I say, walk by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of your flesh, 
for the de desires of the flesh are against the spirit, the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Penalty. And the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like that. Well, that's quite the list that covers most of the things that, that uh, we did without conversion and the world is doing now. Now, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, which is why they'll end up in the lake of fire, the lake of divine cleansing, and all of these ways of thinking and conduct will be removed, and the individual will be purified and cleansed and have an opportunity for salvation. Now, appealing to mediums and astrologers for direction in your life instead of God Almighty are in the same category. Isaiah 47, 8 to 14. But now hear these words, thou luxurious one. Thou art the one who sits at ease, that is secure, that says in her heart, I am, and there is not another. I shall not sit a widow, neither shall I know bereavement. But now these two things shall come upon thee suddenly in one day, the loss of children and widowhood will suddenly come upon thee, for thy sorcery, the strength of your enchantments, thy thrusting in wickedness. For thou said, I am, there is not another. Know thou that the understanding of these things and thy harlotry shall be the shame, uh, shall be thy shame. For thou saidst in thy heart, I am, there is not another, and destruction shall come upon thee, and thou shalt not be aware, and there shall be a pit. You shall fall into it, and grief shall come upon thee, and thou shalt not be able to make clear, and destruction shall come suddenly upon thee, and thou shalt not know. Stand now with your enchantments, with the abundance of your sorceries, which you learn from your youth, if thou canst be profited. You are wearied by their counsels. Let now the astrologers of heaven stand and deliver thee. Let them that see the stars tell thee what is about to come upon thee. Behold, they shall all be burnt up as sticks in the fire, neither shall they at all deliver their life from the flame, because thou hast coals of fire set upon them. So that's from the Septuagint. So the sorcery and the astrology and uh, as a, is different from astronomy. All these things are idol worship and uh, cause the damage to physical creation as well as to humanity and we shouldn't be participating in them or have anything to do with them. Jeremiah 27, 9-10 So, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your fortune tellers, or your sorcerers who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for it is a lie and that they are prophesying to you, with the result that you will be removed far from your land, and I will drive you out and you will perish. Micah 5, 10 to 15, In that day, de de declares Jehovah, I will cut off your horses from among you, destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land and throw out all your strongholds. I will cut off the sorceries from your hand, and you shall mo have no more tellers of fortunes. Fortune tellers. I will cut off your carved images and your pillars among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. I will root out your Asherah poles from among you to destroy your cities. And in anger and wrath, I will execute judgment on nations that did not obey. So here we're a little bit discussing godly jealousy or, or human envy in this matter. Second Corinthians 11, 1 to 2. Would to God that you would bear with me in my little folly, a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This is explaining a godly jealousy for you and for your individual worship, praise, and honor, and acknowledgement as Jehovah alone. And this is not envy for your possessions or your skills. So jealousy becomes a sin when it, a desire for something that does not belong to you overtakes you and alters your conduct. It is your intent that is being judged. 
1 John 5, 17 to 21, all wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come. He has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Uh, Exodus 34:17. You shall not make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. Leviticus 19:4. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am Yehovah, your Elohim. Leviticus 26, uh, verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourselves or erect a pillar, an image or a pillar. You shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am Yehovah, your God. So, Deuteronomy. I guess everybody understands that, that when they're making these representational images, like you see throughout India and in different parts of the world, and you'll see people putting flowers or food at the base of it and bowing and kneeling and praying to this structure, what their belief is that they are, that the, that is an image that opens up the gate so the type of heaven's gate that gives them access to the God they pray to, but that they can't have access to without going through this representational image. That's what this is talking about, and you'll see it anytime you watch any movies or documentaries on India, you'll see it prevalent throughout the whole, because it's in the whole society. So that's what this is talking about. You, you shall not set up a figure stone to bow down to it. People take food. And, and all kinds of offerings, and they will bow down to it and sometimes spend four and five hours on their face before it, pleading for that false god and that false deity for the false worship through a stone or a tree or something else. And I hope everybody understands that. That's what this is talking about. So Deuteronomy 13, starting verse 1, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams or wises among you gives you a sign or wonder, the, the, the sign or wonder that he says comes to pass and if he says let us go after other gods which you have not known let us serve them you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams for Yehovah is testing you to know whether you love Yehovah your God with all your heart with all your soul you shall walk after Yehovah uh, to, to um, your God to fear him to keep his commandments and to obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him but that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against Yehovah, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which Yehovah, your God, commanded you to walk. And so you shall purge the evil from your midst. First Thessalonians 1 and verse 9. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had amongst you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So you'll see a lot of examples in the New Testament where the, the Gentiles are converting and they're burning all their books with, the, with their mantras and sorceries and pharma, you know, pharmacological information for making uh, drugs that, that give them highs and things like that. They would pile them up and burn them. So you can see how the, these people, these individual Gentiles in Thessalonian, Thessalonica uh, would convert, turn from worshiping their gods through their idols to serve the living and true God. Numbers 32, 51 and 52, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you, destroy all their figured stones, destroy all their metal images and demolish their high places. Exodus 34:12. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it becomes a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars, break their pillars, cut down their Asherim. Easter, you shall wor worship no other god for Yehovah, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, when they are whore after their gods, 
sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited. You eat of the sacrifice, and you take their daughters for your sons, and take your their daughters to whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You shall not make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. Okay, eating with idolaters. 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 5, verses 9 to 13. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, world order, or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. Uh, since then, you would have to go out of the world. But now I am speaking to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or swindler. Do not even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those outside inside the church. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges from the outside, purge the evil person from amongst you. So we're all familiar with some of that. First Corinthians eight, one to thirteen. Now concerning food offered to idols. We know that all of us possess knowledge, and this knowledge puffs us up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something and does not yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. There is no God but one. For although there may be uh, so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, and some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and is no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in the idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat the food offered to idols? So by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. 1 Corinthians 10, 18-21 Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, and you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. This aspect of, of us at the feast, following our God, we generally as much as possible try to eat together and feast and enjoy ourselves. And uh, this aspect of eating together actually is, is a matter of your service to your Creator. So it's just something that perhaps uh, doesn't get enough uh, attention or thought, but uh, you can just give it some mind as we c carry on here reading the law. So I'm going to read a, a short section here written by Ambassador Newman. It's for everybody's perusal. They can just think about And then I'll explain a bit of it when, when, when we're done here. So here is his, his, uh, his presentation, the Second Commandment, his opening prayer. Father, may your words be in my hand, in my mind, in my heart, that I may worthily proclaim your second commandment. Statement, I will be your God and you will be my people. Now, this short and simple statement is the essence of the first and second commandments of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the uh, Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Uh, the King James is used throughout here. 2 Corinthians 6.16, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, walk in them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now the second command is found in Exodus 20, 4 to 6, repeated in Deuteronomy 5 to 8. Deut let's see, Exodus 24 to 6, 
Thou shalt make thee no graven image, neither any similitude of things that are in heaven above, neither that are in the earth beneath, nor that are in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, neither shalt thou serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third generation, upon the fourth of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, a special note on the second commandment, it must be noted that the world's largest religion, meaning Catholicism, that professes that the God of the Bible uh, has deleted the second commandment of God, of God entirely. So uh, when you read certain Catholic versions of the Bible, you will see that there is no, there is a second commandment, but it's actually the third in order. And the tenth commandment is divided in two, so you still add up to ten. But the second commandment has been removed. You see that. It's deleted the second commandment of God entirely and divided the tenth commandment into two to make an even ten. It was, dele- was it deleted because of little importance? Was it deleted because it's the most important commandment necessary to understanding the complete law and to ensure we're not deceived? So the second commandment receives this. Thou shalt make thee no graven image. So an image is a representation, a similitude, a likeness, a copy of a thing. An image is a, a copy in your imagination or to form a likeness in your mind. An image is never the thing itself, but a reflection of it. An image is nothing. It is not real. And when you, when you make it a graven image, you produce the image on the surface of a thing. You can now see it, and it seems real. It becomes a dead likeness or a record of a thing, but it is still just an image or a likeness of the real thing. It is art, artificial as opposed to natural. So grave is a graven, graven or graved. Originally, all writing was graving. In the scripture, the word graven is used as a writing of a permanent record. Exodus 39, 6. They wrought onyx stones enclosed in in pouches of gold, graven as signets are graven with the names of the children of Israel. In Exodus 32, 16, and the writing of the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. So graven also has the meaning of solemn, sober, serious, as opposed to gay, light, or jovial, as a man of grave deportment, a grave character, God is not saying you cannot have an imagination, but we are prohibited from acting and behaving in a solemn or serious way based on an image of a thing as if it was real. In today's legal system, a graven image is referred to as a fiction of law. So the command continues, the second commandment here, neither any similitude of things that are in heaven above, neither that are in the earth beneath, nor that are in waters under the earth. Now, a similitude is a resemblance, a likeness of a thing that's sim- is similar in some qualities, but not the same thing. A sim- similitude is a simile, a word or phrase by which anything is likened in one or more of its aspects to something else, an imaginative comparison. Similitudes are formed with words like or as, to be like or to be as, Uh, The prohibition in this commandment may be the best definition of iniquity. It is unrighteousness. Now, this part of the command is all comprehensive, and we are prohibited from making a likeness or a similitude of anything. And this can only be used as a copyright protection that God has placed on all of his creation. You could also view this part of the command as a patent protection on property. Anything we make in the likeness of his creation would be a forgery and a counterfeit. Uh, this, uh, this command is so absolutely complete and entire that there is no way to make or create a false god or act or behave in the image of a false god without violating this command. The command then continues with the new sentence, Thou shalt not bow down to them, neither serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third generation, upon the fourth of them that uh, hate me, showing mercy to thousands of to them that love me and keep my commandments. So this part of the command tells us what to do if others have made graven images. 
We are not to bow down to them or serve them. If you do, then God is jealous. He wants the love you are given to a false god. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So this part of the command also tells us the making of an image of God in the place of God and making of an image of us as a creature of this false god is iniquity. So this command ends with a warning. He will visit us on our iniquity and every generation that continues to hate him. We know that it is iniquity that separates us from God, and that separation from God results in death. This command assures us that we will receive mercy if we love him and keep his commandments. The simple version of the second commandment would be, do not make for yourself an imaginary God and become the imaginary people of this God. For I will be your God and you will be my people. Now, the second commandment does not mention an idolatry, idol or idolatry, but the bowing to and the serving of a graven image makes it an idol. The image, form, or representation made of God is an idol. It can never be the true God. Scripture clearly tells us not to make a similitude of God as he is spirit. John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 16, Take thee therefore good heed unto the, yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that Jehovah spoke to you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image of similitude of any figure in the likeness of male or female. So idolatry is the act, both in body and the mind, of serving, obedience to, and worship of idols, images, any part of the creation, anything that is made by hands, or which is not God. An idol is anything which usurps the place of God in the hearts of his rational creatures. So Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the first incidence of idolatry and iniquity where the, the, the place of God was usurped was occurred in the garden. Man took the throne of God they, when they succumbed to the will of Satan. Satan wants us to do our own will to become as gods. He wants to separate us from God that we should die. Genesis 3, 4 to 5, And the serpent said unto the woman, you surely, you shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then their eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. As a, simili as a similitude is a violation of the second commandment. Now, the second commandment does not only en encompass graven images, but likenesses of anything. So that would include graven images, similitudes, idols, molten images, rearing up a stand standing image of anything. This also would include the molten image of the crown, which the queen wears, the United States flag, which all plead, plead, uh, pledge allegiance to with their hand over their heart. Uh, Exodus 26, 1, Ye shall make no idols or graven image, neither shall you rear up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am Jehovah your God. Isaiah 42, 17. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, You are our gods. So violating the second commandment is a snare. A snare is something that catches you unawares. Exodus 23, 33. They shall not uh, dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. Exodus 34:12. Take heed to thyself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where thou goest, lest it becomes a snare in the midst of thee. Psalm 106, verse 36. They served their idols, which were a snare unto them. So God repeatedly warns us of the danger of idols. We are to destroy them and flee from them. Exodus 19.4, Turn not unto idols, nor make yourselves to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. 1 John 5.21, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10.14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Deuteronomy 7.5, 
But thus ye shall deal with them, ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire. We are not to partake in or eat anything sacrificed to idols. 1 Corinthians 8.4 as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idol, we know that an idol is nothing in this world, and there is not other God but one. So is it possible we could practice idolatry unknowingly, but in fact do it willingly? The self-test for idolatry would be find the source of your law you practice. The source of your law is your lawgiver. Your true lawgiver is your God, or your law lawgiver is that you accept their law is your God. As with all things good and evil, they are opposites. To visualize the practice of idolatry, we can look at a pyramid, a triangle, then look at an upside-down pyramid and an upside-down triangle. With a pyramid, we have God at the top. Out of one God, there are many. In idolatry, we have an upside-down pyramid where out of many, we are one as God. When we turn the upside-down pyramid upright and place our imaginary God over us, then we obtain and hold identification. A similitude is being created in the image of our God. The first pyramid has God creating man. The second pyramid has man created an Im imaginary God. The first pyramid has all power coming down from God. The second pyramid has all power given up to an imaginary God, your governant, or your head of state. E pluribus unum is Latin for out of many, we are one. And this is the structure of every nation on earth. It is written on every coin in the U.S. currency. So Psalm 96, 5, for all gods of the nations are idols, but Yehovah made the heavens. Psalm 97, 6, confounded be they, be all they that serve graven images that boast themselves of idols and worship him, all ye gods. So when man joins himself to what uh, to become one being, this one being is what God calls the beast. Genesis 11, 6, And Yehovah said, Behold, this people is one. They all have one language. And this is they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained to them that they have imagined to do. Now, the head of every state, or of every nation on earth, considered as the father of the nation, and we are the sons. So God tells us the following. Malachi 2.10, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously, every man against his brothers, by profaning the covenant of our fathers? John 8.41, ye do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, uh, we be not born of fornication, we have one Father, even God. So in Webster's uh, 1928 dictionary, a countryman is, is defined as a pagan. An anthem is defined as a, is defined as a hymn, and a hymn is a song to your God. We are taught that we can have both the love of country and love of God. We are taught that we can be both a son of Canada and a son of God. We are taught that we can love and serve our country and serve and love God both. But God says, Matthew, 20, Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So, were you born in the sovereign dominion of Canada, or were you born in the sovereign dominion of God? One is automatic. The other you had to join by registering your birth. The son of Canada is a fiction of law, a similitude of a man created in the living image of God. Your nation's birth certificate is the graven image of you, by Ambassador Newman. So continuing on here, but what does uh, Yehovah say about all this? The nation's statutes. Leviticus 18, 3 to 5. Yehovah spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the people of Israel, say to them, I am Yehovah your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you live. You shall not do as um, they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not watch in their statutes. You shall follow my rules, keep my statutes, and walk in them. I am Yehovah your Elohim. You shall keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am Yehovah. 
Leviticus 20, 22 to 23. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and my rules and do them, that the land where I am bringing you uh, to live may not vomit you out. You shall not walk in the customs of the nations I am driving out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. Exodus 23, 24 to 27. You shall not bow down to their gods or serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them, break their pillars and pieces. You shall serve Jehovah, your God. He will bless your bread and your water. I will take sickness away from you. None of you shall miscarry or be barren in the land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you, will throw into confusion uh, all the people against whom you shall come. I shall make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Deuteronomy 12, 1-4. to Now these are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that Jehovah, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on earth. You shall surely destroy the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains, on the hills, under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars, dash them in pieces, their pillars, burn their asherah poles with fire. You shall chop down their carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship Yehovah, your God, in that way. Deuteronomy 12, 29-32 When Yehovah, your God, cuts off before you the nations whom you go to dispossess, and you just dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you are not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, that I may do the same? And you shall not worship uh, Yehovah, your Elohim, in that way for every abominable thing that Yehovah hates, they have done for their gods. They even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything that I command you, be careful to do, you shall not add to it or take away from it. Leviticus 18, uh, 25 to 30, but and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity. The land vomited out its inhabitants, but you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations, either the native nor the stranger who sojourns amongst you. For the people of the land who are before you did all these abominations so that the land became unclean. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean as it vomited out the nation that was before you, for everyone who does what any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you. Never make yourselves unclean by them. I am Jehovah, your Elohim. Second Kings um, 17, 14 to 17. But they would not listen. They were stubborn, as their fathers had been, who did not believe in Jehovah, their God. They despised his statutes, his covenant that he made with them, with their fathers. And the warnings he gave to them, they went after false idols, became false. They followed the nations that were around them, concerning whom Yehovah commanded them that they should not do like them. They abandoned all the commandments of Yehovah, their God, made for themselves metal images, two calves. They made an Asherah, worshipped all the host of heaven, served their Baal. They burned their sons and their daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to do evil in the, evil in the sight of Yehovah, provoking him to anger. Psalm 106, 35 to 38. But they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. And so have the lost ten tribes of Israel from northwest Europe and uh, the British Commonwealth of Nations. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons with uh, abortion systems that are not in place simply to save the life of the mother. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Jeremiah 10, 1-6, Hear the word that Yehovah speaks to you, O house of Israel. 
Thus says Jehovah, learn not the ways of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of these people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with the axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with gold and silver. They fasten it with a hammer and nail so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Don't be afraid of them, for they not come do they cannot do evil, and neither is it in them to do good. There is none like you, O Yehovah. You are great, and your name is great in might. Now we may keep the statutes and the legal requirements of the nation, or rules of order of individual households of men, that do not conflict with the law of God of the Almighty and grace. So Romans 12, 2 to 3, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, for by the grace given to me, I say everyone among you ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So you have man-ruled nations are worthless. So all nations are less than nothing and worthless. Isaiah 40, 15 to 17. Behold, all the nations are as a drop in the bucket. They are counted as dust, the small dust upon the scale. Look, he lift up his uh, uh, the aisles of the very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient for him to burn, nor is beef sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted by him as less than nothing and worthless. Verse 23, he brings the princes to nothing, and he makes the judges of the earth useless. New King James. Uh, Isaiah 41, 27. The first time I said to Zion, look, there they are. I will give Jerusalem to one who brings good tidings. For I looked, and there was no man. I looked among them, and there was no counselor, who, when I asked of them, could answer the word. Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. Ezekiel 28, 1-2, the word of Jehovah came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says Adonai Yehovi, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God, I will sit in the seat of gods, in the seat of the seas, yet you are a man, and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. You can see we have this tendency, especially in the executive branches and our leaders, they continually appear to want the power and set themselves in their heart, to act as God. So Psalm 9, 17 to 20, the wicked shall return for Sheol, meaning hell or the, or the hole in the ground, the grave. All nations that forget God are termed wicked and they're all going to end up in the pit. For the needy shall not always be forgotten and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Yehovah, let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Yehovah. Let the nations they know that they are but men. Shalah. Now, if Yehovah gave 40 years for Judah's repentance before causing war, famine, and captivity. He is now giving 40 jubilees for the whole of mankind's repentance before the tribulation and restitution of all things. Everyone will soon know that they are less than nothing without their Creator. Because with your Creator and with the Spirit of God, you are sons of, of a, the one true God, and we'll see what, what happens with us at the resurrections. But to understand the distinction between these two things, they're quite strong scriptures. They don't get covered very much on that these nations are less than nothing and useless. Although, it certainly would be uh, close to true if you listen to the, most of what's going on in the news. So, there is one true God alone, our Father, our progenitor. He alone has life inherent as he is life. He is the one being with the title Eloah and the name Yehovah. So, warning. Revelation 
I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this book of prophecy, uh, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Amen. So we will uh, never knowingly take away from or add to the word of God ever. So please, uh, Yehovah, accept our praise, honor, way of life, and liberty in the greatest of appreciation to you alone without idolatry. We ask for this, please, by the authority of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you, James, for that presentation. This uh, subject of idolatry is interesting. You know, idolatry can creep in in very subtle ways. It's not always, you know, the uh, bowing down and worshiping of a statue or a tree or something like that. It's, uh, it can appear in other ways, as James articulated. Um, and as he said here, we endeavor to never add to or take away from the Word of God. And we also uh, endeavor to uh, obey God rather than men. He is our God and uh, there is no other. So, with that, we'll have our final hymn. If you'll please stand and turn to page 116 in the hymnal. On page 116, we'll sing our final hymn, which comes to us from... Exodus 15, I will sing to Yehovah, after which I will uh, give the closing prayer. So, 116, I will sing to Yehovah. Okay, if you'll remain standing and bow your heads for the closing prayer. Almighty, Yehovah, we come before you at the close of this service, Father, to again thank you so much for calling us out of this world to be a part of the body of Christ, to be a part of the work that you're accomplishing on this planet. The work we've been commissioned to do, to preach the gospel to the world as a witness, 
we endeavor to do as diligently as possible, Father. We ask Almighty Yehovah that you would instill in us a desire to do your will, a desire to understand your ways, and Father, that you would give us the direction and work within us your Holy Spirit to cause us to do those things which are pleasing in your sight. We know, Father, that without your Spirit, without your intervention in our lives, we can do nothing. We are not responsible for our own salvation in terms of being able to do it because it is your Spirit that works in us and acts in us to cause us to will to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. And without your spirit, we can't do it. So, Father, we are ever thankful for the fact that you do work in our lives through your Holy Spirit. And we ask, Father, that you would bless your people all around this planet with a good measure of your Holy Spirit to give us and help us have the endurance we need in order to withstand the assault of the accuser. So, Father, we ask that you would open our eyes to an even greater understanding, that you would reveal to us even our secret sins so that we might walk uprightly before you. We ask that you do all of this in mercy and love, Father, for we do not want to be overwhelmed with our own shortcomings and wickedness. So, Father, we ask that as we close this service, that you would continue to be with us and continue to watch over us. We ask that you heal those that need healing and comfort those who need comfort. We ask that you bless our afternoon meals or whatever meals we'll be partaking of around the planet. And again, Father, we're so grateful for the fact that we can be here meeting with those of like minds from all around the world. And we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to be a part of this assembly. So, Father, we ask now for your dismissal. We thank you. We praise your great and holy name and ask all of this in the name of Yahushua the Messiah. Amen.